Hi, it's William from Boxer 2 Valve, and we've been tearing apart components off of this uh, R80, and um, I've got the final drive off the other day, and we're going to go ahead and take this apart today, but first I'm going to go ahead and clean this up, get some of the big chunks of dirt and brake dust off of there, and then move on. It looks, it, looks much, it looks much better now, and I just want to mention this final drive is for an 85 and later model lever, the single-sided swing arm version. Uh, and it's a little bit different procedure, but very similar, however, in other ways. And anyway, the first thing we're going to do is uh, take the brake arm off. And if you're pretty sure that the, that the indexing is correct, uh, this lever is on a spline, then it's not a bad idea to mark that. You can use a chisel make a little, or a punch, make a little mark corresponding to the slit there, but I'm not so sure, I don't think it was actually set up right, so I'll index it when I go up to reassemble. So I'm just gonna go ahead and remove that right now. And there's a little felt piece here that you're probably gonna wanna replace when you put it back together. There are also a couple of O-rings on this shaft that you'll probably want to replace when you put it back together. Now to work on this, I made this pretty cool little tool. It's just a piece of flat steel and with a hole saw, two and five eighths, or about 67 millimeters, I made this hole and then drilled these holes here. And this makes it really easy and solid to work on. Just using the original nuts that came off, you can attach that like so. And this enables me to put this solidly in the vise. Now we can take this thing apart. You're going to need a tool that looks something like this. And it's easy enough to make something like that. It's uh, basically just a piece of steel that's been turned down on a lathe. Very simple thing to do. This part here is 13.7 millimeters, and this part here is 15.7 millimeters. That's what we came up with. It fits right here. The purpose is to push this sleeve through. And so that fits nicely inside there. And a couple of ways you can go about doing this. One is to um, hit it out with a hammer, which is okay. That's really the correct way in, in a sense. That's the way the BMW factory tool is designed to be used. But alternatively, you can also press it out with a press, which I kind of like better if when you, when you hit it, you do the run the risk of kind of mushrooming the sleeve a little bit. And so, um, we don't need to really push it out all the way. We need to push it down so that it comes out about maybe two and a half to three centimeters. And that'll more than clear the cover so we can remove the cover. So I'm just going to go over to the press and push this pin out. Prior to doing so, I'm going to warm it up a bit with my heat gun. That's close enough. I'll just get the press set up. Okay, the final drive is nice and warm, and I'm going to put the tool that I made into the bushing. And then using, this is just a piece of tubing, um, something like this, to support underneath. And set the whole thing in the press. Okay, back to the vise. Okay, great. Okay, now with the, put, with the tube pushed out of the way, I'm ready to remove these bolts. Now to get the cover off of there, you're gonna to need to come up with a couple of M5 bolts that'll screw into these two tapped holes here and then just sequentially tighten these bolts back and forth. And 
at some one point, then the cover will be loose and the bolts can be removed. You just lift that right out. Okay. So, pretty grimy in there. Um, we'll go ahead and separate the ring gear from the cover housing. Usually, it's not a super tight fit, so if you just support the cover with your fingers like that and give a few taps on the center, there we go, comes off. So we'll look at this in a bit, but with the big bearing here, the tapered roller bearing on this end, and we're going to want to give these a thorough cleaning before changing out the seal. So we'll do that in a bit. Be mindful of that the fact that there are shims in here too, so don't lose those. Now let's have a look and see what's going on here. This metal plate can just be lifted right out. Also needs to be cleaned. And man, this is really grimy in here. There is like a ton of sludge inside. Not good. <laughs> also, there's really quite a lot of wear on these pinion teeth. But I want to get that all apart and clean it thoroughly before jumping to any conclusions about the condition of it. But so far, not so good. Okay, next we'll go around to the pinion end. For that, I'm going to flip the fixture around 180 degrees. Okay, the first thing we got to do is remove this this nut from the end of the pinion and to do that you're going to need a tool that looks like this. Um, basically it's, it's a copy of the original BMW tool. Now we've made a few of these. We, we took some uh, old drive shaft couplings and cut them Part, made these rings and we've made a handful of these we're gonna, we have enough parts to make quite a few more so we have these available now um, we make them here in-house just from a old that old ring and welding on a, a piece a couple pieces of steel the way the tool works is it fits right over the pinion gear and immobilizes it so that it can't spin and it just moves against these studs. So with that tool installed, now I can go ahead and remove the, the nut. These are usually pretty tight, so I use a big breaker bar, hold the tool firmly in place, and then break it loose. Okay, the nut comes off. Beneath that is a washer. And then the pinion gear can come out. Sometimes you just pull it off with your fingers. If not, a couple of screwdrivers, like so, or just weaving one, there it comes right off. Then there's a, like a wax seal of sorts right here that's gonna have to be replaced when we reassemble. The next part that needs to come out is this ring nut. And to remove that, you'll need a tool that looks like this. This is something that we offer. And you need to line that up with the holes. And be before you use the tool, though, you'll want to heat up this part of the case with a heat gun to expand the metal. and soften any sealant that might be in there so that the nut comes out easier and without any damage. Okay. So that's sufficiently warm. Now I'm going to put the tool in. And good idea is to Give that tool a couple of wraps to make sure it's firmly seated. And then once again, using a big breaker bar, because these are usually really pretty tight, I'm gonna go in there and then at the same time I'm loosening it, hold the tool in 
as hard as you can so it doesn't slip out. There we go. And that's where the pinion seal is located. We'll be changing that out after cleaning this part. Okay, now that this is still warm from before, I'm gonna, to pull the pinion out, I'm gonna get it really hot. So I'll go back right away and keep going with the heat gun. Hopefully that's hot enough. I'm going to put the nut back on by a couple of threads. And hopefully with a couple of screwdrivers the pinion will come right out. Not yet. When you get it hot enough, the pinion will come out. Just got to get it pretty hot. At that point now, I'm going to grab it with some pliers. Don't want to drop it. There we go. Support it. Okay, no. So that is now out. Let that cool before I actually do anything more with it. Okay, now since now the case is still hot, now is a perfect time to take out the the other bearings inside of the housing. The outer race of the tapered roller is the first one that I'll take out. Okay, for this task, really, you're gonna need the Kuko puller. This is the 21-6 puller, which is the same one used for pulling steering head bearings out on all two valve twins. I'll set that down inside, tighten the nut. And actually, the case is so warm, that just by using this puller, I'm able to get the bearing out, which is great. So if you don't have one of these, you could try, I guess, something else. If you get it hot enough, they usually will, things will come apart. Now, the next thing we're going to do is remove the, the needle bearing on the end of the pinion. And typically, there's no real easy way to get that out of there. You're probably going to damage it, even with the right tools. But it has to come out of there in order for us to thoroughly clean everything and evaluate the condition. And so for that, we use a Kugo puller. This one is the 21-4. And it'll fit right in there. Hold it in all the way. And then tighten the nut to expand it. And again, tighten that down with a wrench so that's got a good bite on the bearing. Now, you've seen Kuko pullers used in some of our other videos. It's really an awesome tool. In this application, however, you're not gonna be able to use this setup without an extension. And so there comes the the 21-V-0 extension kit from Kuko. And this is ours from the shop here. It's all, you can see all grimy looking. But it's a wonderful set. It comes with various extensions. Now for this one, we're going to need, I think this guy right here for the size.
And so, as you can see, basically it's a sleeve with a threaded rod and, and uh, this will screw on to the puller. And then this basically screws down onto the puller as well. So it ex essentially extends the length of the puller. Now we can thread this bridge on there. And now we'll be able to screw this nut in until we get all the way down to that holding tool. And then we should be able to reheat the case, get the back up to, to temperature again, and rather easily extract the pinion bearing if everything goes according to plan. There we go. And what's nice is we're pushing against that, that steel tool, not against the case, so pretty, pretty sano. Now we're ready to heat this back up a bit. Gonna set the heat gun right in there. The big one, 32 millimeters, what you need. And you can see how the Kuko puller worked. It went in and it grabbed right inside of that little recess on the bearing, made a really clean, solid connection, and allowed us to pull the bearing out, possibly with no damage, but like I said before, probably a good idea to change out that bearing. That's what I pr prefer to do. Okay, so now we've got the final drive really reduced to its very basic components. And we're gonna give everything a thorough cleaning and then evaluate the condition of the gears and gather all the parts that we need to reassemble. And we're gonna keep moving on it. So I'm gonna head off and clean this up and then we'll get back to the rest of this procedure. For that purpose, I'm going to remove this, the final drive from my, my holding fixture. It's still a little bit warm, but not too bad. Very luckily, the threads in here for the swing arm fill and drain are in good condition. They're oftentimes stripped out because of people over tightening them. That's the good news. The bad news is that I noticed that there's something funky going on here. There's um, somebody put a, looks like a 3 8 inch plug in there. So that's pretty much indicative to me that those threads are buggered. So we're gonna go ahead, go ahead and have to fix that too before we reassemble anything. But first things first, let's get this thing clean and then we'll keep going. Well, that's the longest time I ever spent cleaning parts, just kind of messing around, but it's been a, a little while since we shot that segment that you we just finished right now. I went to the uh, solvent had to clean everything up and came up with the determination that the, the teeth on the uh, final drive were really shot, unusable. So I was able to find um, a couple of used ones um, this is kind of the condition that they're in, but seem to be in pretty good shape. I took the worst of the two and took that all apart, but it's been, like I said, I'll get, we'll get back into the mechanics of it in just a second. But here we are in about the middle of April, 2020, and we're in this uh, whole Corona madness and all that sort of thing. Um, I'm looking kind of shabby. I know I, I lost a non-essential crown, but um, it's no big deal. But that's just want to let you know, I haven't like gone off the deep end or something. That's the reason why it's like that. So we've come here today because the show must go on under Cloak of Darkness. I'm here with Jeff, who's the producer, director, cameraman, gaffer, sound engineer, editor, and great inspiration. He's the guy who makes this all happen. He's really the one that we ought to be grateful for. But we're here today, despite all the craziness, and we're going to keep going. Enough about all that nonsense. And... Um, Let's get back to motorcycle stuff. 
So I cleaned this up pretty well in the solvent tank, and it looks all right, but it would have been blasted. But so here's the deal. These, the teeth are just shot on here. And they're not really, in my opinion, usable anymore. They're just, there's just been too much wear. They've, there, there was a lot of, um, I don't know, I think a lack of maintenance on this final drive is what caused it. It was this, this black goop inside. It took a lot to get the stuff as clean as it is, even so it's just like really caked inside there. And there's all those metal particles that just been wearing off over time. And, and this final drive is cooked. So unfortunately, as of right now, there's really no more spare parts for this. So you can't buy a ring and pinion except for the really low ratio. There were three ratios. One like for, we use on the R65, and then the, uh, the really highly coveted one is, the, is the, the, the 3.0, which was used on the RS and the RT, R100 that is. And those are really like, as far as I know, almost impossible to get. If anybody has one, I'd be real interested in one for one of my bikes. But anyway, the middle one is the, uh, the R80, and that's a 32-10 ratio. So I was able to score one of those and um, took it all apart. And so I've already gone ahead and vapor blasted the case. So this is all ready to put back together. We've got all the parts here. So this is gonna, gonna be cool. And we've got here the, the gears that came out of this one. This one actually has some wear, but it's like totally serviceable, I think. And it doesn't have any of the gouging. Let's look at these side by side and see that, okay, there's some wear, but that's just honest wear. Whereas this has got some serious pitting and just, it's just really bad, bad, bad scoring. Look at that right in here. You just see how kind of torched that is mm -hmm. compared to how smooth that is. And then to compare the uh, ring gears, let's look at that. So you can kind of see how this is just kind of all ripped up, especially on this back side here. Kind of really see that 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 mark on there, and these teeth are just really—they're pretty worn. It wouldn't be something that would I'd want to run for a long period of time. Whereas this one is actually in really okay shape. There, it's obviously you know it's a used part, but it's it's totally okay. Now speaking of used parts, not everything's perfect. It's when you have a used part, you know there's always going to be something. So when I took this apart. This was just really, this seal surface is where that is, was really, um, really rough. A lot of corrosion, maybe it, it, it had a lot of pitting, and there was a real deep score in there. You can still see a little bit of where the seal rode, but what I did was I put it in the lathe with a live center, and I took just about like a quarter of a millimeter off, just a little bit at a time, and I got just down to where all the pitting is taken away, and then I polished it. So it's a good sealing surface. There's enough tolerance in the seal, in the in this pliability of the seal to it to make up for that little bit of decrease in diameter. No big deal. You can see this one, even though the teeth are, are really torched, was, it, was not in too bad a shape. You see where the seal was riding and you can see little bits of corrosion starting here. It's very common but not bad at all. In fact, if the teeth had been okay, I probably wouldn't even have done more than just polish that. But on this one, I had to actually take some material off to get it smooth again. So that's that. Now, before we get into reassembly of this thing, what I'll do is, even though I don't really need to take this apart because it's just going in the, in the scrap bin, I'm gonna take it apart just to show you how to take these bearings off or what's involved in taking these bearings off. We'll start with the ring gear. Okay, for pulling off this bearing, it's, it's, it can be a real bugger to get that thing off. You need a really good tool. This triple arm cuckoo puller is really good. There's other ones like this, but you know, it, the quality of the cuckoo really shines because it really, 
is under a lot of tension to pull this off. But I'll show you how that works. Now, you need to have a place to push the big hollow thing. Perfect is this really awesome pressure pad set from Kuko. And check this out. This is the coolest thing. It comes like this, three pieces, and you can stack them in different ways depending on what you have going on. If you're just pushing on a, on a small shaft, you can use this little one. You can stack those up like that to get different sizes. And very, very versatile, fantastic tool. So, so here's the object here. We need to bridge that big hole. So this doesn't quite fit inside, so that's not going to work, but we can flip it upside down. And we got a nice solid perch on that area there. And then we can put this piece in there and that piece in there. And now we got a great place to push against. It's the coolest thing ever. I'm like so happy with this. And then now we'll take this puller and set that on the bearing in such a way. And now you can see how that point goes right into that pad. It's just brilliant, brilliant. Okay, now we gotta make sure that it's really tight under the bearing. So that's, that's basically, this is the setup here. On the bearing, right there. Nice pad set there, centered up. Got a good piece of the action on all three sides, so there you have it. Now what I like to do on something like this, because it's so much tension, I'll actually chuck the puller up into the vise. Now, keep one hand on this at all times because it might pop loose and you don't want to have that happen. Also, whenever you're working with pullers, put some glasses on, important. We'll put that under some tension. Now this puller isn't gonna, it's not gonna come apart without some heat, I can pretty much tell you. But we can get it kind of preloaded real nice. Oh, it did come off, okay, didn't it? Yeah. So sometimes you're gonna need some heat and what works well then is like a propane torch. A lot of people talk about map gas, that might be the thing, I've never tried it before. I think it's awfully hot, but concentrate heat here on this inner race to try to loosen things up. And then, I think this is out of gas. And you would go in and you would heat this all up like that. But in this case, it's coming off without heat, which is not always the case. So you have to be prepared to apply some heat. This one is coming off by the sheer power of the Kuko puller. There we go. That's why you want to hold on to that because you drop it otherwise. And then you need to get that all out of the puller. And that's why I like to put the puller in the vise because I got two hands to work with all the parts as they come off. So that's all there is to it on that bearing. This tool will work great to get that off. And then we pull the other bearing off. For this bearing, you just, you need the uh, 17K puller kit like you use on the gearboxes. And it's uh, also really handy for the uh, final drive puller. Okay, so what we'll do now is use, using this puller, this uh, pad set again, I'm gonna, the, uh, this part here is a little bit smaller in diameter than, than the uh, piece on the final drive. So I'll lay that on there, put the pressure pad piece on top like so, and at least we will get that, that bearing loose. That'll be a good start. So we've just exhausted the range of that 
puller set off, but I've set it up that way because the most tension that you ever have when pulling a bearing off is that initial breaking loose. After that, it's pretty easy. So now I think it's safe to take the tool and invert it. Wouldn't want to do that on initial pull because I wouldn't want to sp spread that out, but the tension is pretty mild right now. I can set that on there like so. And give this a little bit more there and then tighten that up. Okay. And now it should fairly easily come off the uh, rest of the way without damaging anything. Okay, so that's what we had to do to get the, the other ring gear into the condition that it's in right now. Just wanted to show how that all comes apart. Now you'll see there's a shim here that fits underneath this tapered roller bearing. And these shims come in varying thicknesses. And the, what they do is, if you can imagine, you've got this tapered roller bearing down inside the case here. Here's the, here's a bearing, for example. Here's that, that's sitting in the case. This is on the ring gear, this bearing. And then that shim is in there. So what happens is the thickness of that shim will determine the elevation of the ring gear, and that will affect the amount of play or backlash that we'll have. We'll get into that later on, but that's basically what that shim is, is, is doing. So be, be, be mindful that you have that there. Okay, so this thing is gonna make some sort of maybe cool little uh, thing on my fireplace mantle or something. I don't know, we'll see what we can do with that. All right, now on the uh, pinion, pinion gear. Note how that comes off of there, tapered, and this big washer like that. So it's come off of there. And then this whole bearing can be removed. You can do it with a Kuko puller as well, with the 17K. So there's a setup there. I got the pressure pad here set up like that, a couple of them set up so it's a nice press on the end of that shaft and this firmly on the back side of this pinion bearing and let's uh, let it rip. These aren't, aren't usually super tight, so it doesn't take much. Okay, so what's happened here is that I, and in pulling it off, it basically has dislodged the, the uh, whole bearing race. You can see there's already quite a gap in here, but it basically caused the bearing to come apart, which is okay. It's basically is a three-piece sort of assembly. We'll analyze that later. I'm just gonna get these out of the way for right now so you can actually see, which I'll take this out just so you can see. So I got enough of a perch on it on that initial pull to pull this out and then the rest of the bearing just kind of fell apart. But this part would still need to come off. But now I can get an even a, even a better bite on it with, the, with this puller. So that's, the, that's it. So here's basically what you have with this bearing, is it's a double roller bearing. You see two rows, and there's these two races that go in like that. So they're kind of just, it's like there's three pieces to it, essentially. That's, that's that. Okay, now the other bearing you need to take off of here, if you're gonna replace all the bearings, is this needle bearing. This one can also be a bit of a bugger, but Luckily, we have our 17K puller from Kuko. And I'm going to get in there and try to get a bite on that little lip that's there. There's not much of one. 
So having a good tool is very important here. We want to get that pretty darn tight so we can get the best shot at getting a, getting a grab on that bearing. It's starting to slip a little bit, so we'll try to get a better bite on that. Okay, so this just goes to show you, every, every bike, every, every one of them is just like a little bit different. When I took the uh, bearing off of this pinion just the other day, it came off like pretty easy. This one is a bugger. I'm not able to get a good bite on there. So what I'm gonna do is just grind a couple grooves on here so that the puller can get a little bit better bite on the bearing and then it'll come off no problem. So I'm just gonna do that real quick. All right, that, that ought to make a pretty big difference. Um, we'll, see, we'll see if it did. That's all it took. Just needed a little bit better bite on that bearing. So you can see what I basically did is I just cut a couple little grooves opposite each other in there. Didn't go all the way through the bearing, just, just a little bit, maybe one and a half millimeters deep, something like that. Enough so that the, the uh, 17K puller could just get in and latch onto that instead of this very sort of weak edge here on the, on the end of the bearing. And it comes right off, so that's that. So we basically did that now like I said, because just wanted to kind of show you how, how this stuff comes apart. And so we're not going to use any of these parts. I'm going to get rid of all this stuff and turn our focus to the parts that came out of the other final drive. All right, so we'll start with the pinion. So here's the new bearing. There we go. Don't really need gloves right now because everything's all clean and like brand new. Okay, so when they machine this part originally, when they machined it originally at the factory, they of course strive for exact tolerances, but invariably there's going to be plus minus a small amount. And so this machining process here determines the resting surface of this bearing. And when you get, if you ever do one of these, I'm not going to go into real big detail because you'll need to have a good manual to explain all this stuff and review it and everything. But in a nutshell, there's a standard ideal tolerance or ideal measurement with that, what that depth should be. And then there's a variance. And the variance is stamped here on the case. It tells you it was a little bit too deep or not quite deep enough or whatever, or the variance from the ideal. Now, when we're putting the same ring and pinion parts in the housing that they came out of, we can kind of assume a lot of things that, the, that they did it right, especially when you see the wear pattern on here is so, so great. So what I can do is, because there's also tolerances in bearings, is I've got the old bearing which came out and the new bearing which is going in. And what's important, what's critical here, is the width of the outer bearing race. So simply enough, what I'll do is measure them both to compare. Theoretically, theoretically they should be very close to the same, if not identical, because this is a very, this is definitely a high precision bearing. So I'm gonna clean the surface off this old bearing really well, first of all. And let's see what kind of a measurement we get on that surface here. Oh, you need the specs for that too. So, 
right about 25.4 is what I'm getting here. And so close to the same measurement. Three nine. Yeah, so you see the bearings are, that's a hundredth of a millimeter. That's pretty much within it, the tolerances here. So I, can do, so I can basically use the same shim that came out and with this bearing, because the measure is the same as the one that came out of there, we can at least make an assumption that it's gonna be correct. So then we also need the pinion bearing and that is supplied like this. And these need to go on here now. Okay, so what it's all about is putting this pinion bearing on here. And you'll notice that there's a little bit of a chamfer. There's also a little bit of a rounded edge. So obviously, that's how that bearing has to go on. This one can go on in any direction. It doesn't really matter, but it needs to go on like that on there. So these all need to be pressed on together. And this is best done in a press, which I'm going to do right now. So we took a piece, just took a plate of steel like this that we got a drop from a machine shop around here and just drilled a hole in it for this exact purpose. It's really great because it just gives it a super solid foundation to press on. And then we'll go ahead and put a piece on here that's slightly larger than the, than the uh, inside of the shaft. So we get full, we, we, so that everything compresses perfectly together and then just press it together. Okay, so that, I'm happy with that. That's all good to go. All right, so the next thing we need to do is install the pinion bearing and then install the pinion itself here. And for that, we're gonna have to get everything nice and hot. And then while we're at it and everything's nice and hot, we'll go ahead and install the outer race of the new tapered roller bearing. And we get that ready to go here. And all we need for that right now is this outer ring here. So we'll get, proceed to get this all nice and toasty and then drop those bearings in. Okay, so I've got the final drive in my special tool here in the vise and got that kind of snug down in this position so that everything will kind of go into place really well. First thing I'll do is take that shim and place that in here so first of all, I don't forget, and it's a whole lot easier to do when it's cold than when it's hot. And now we're gonna get some heat going on here. Now I do like using heat guns, as some folks have said, you know, why don't you use map gas or something like that? But, you know, I've had bad experience with stuff getting like too hot and distorting. And it causes a whole nother can of worms. I've got more time than money, so I'd rather not ruin parts, you know? And so it's easy, easy goes, easy goes. It, it, you know, you can always step away and heat gun just as a thing. You won't, you won't break it by using a heat gun or melt it. And if you are in a big hurry, you can always just bring a second heat gun to the party and uh, get it happening a little quicker. Of course, the other thing you could do too is put it in the oven and heat the whole thing up for this. That would actually be pretty slick. I don't have an oven here. I don't think my wife would mind too much, but I'm not doing this at home. So it might, but that would be something you could do too, just put it in the oven. You'd want to probably 
The ideal temperature is 100 degrees C, so like around 2, 220, 212 is, is 100 degrees C, but you know, like set your oven at about two, 200 to 210. Oh, and one more thing while we're heating this thing up to mention is these uh, filler and drain plug holes on the final draw on the here on the final drive, the drain and filler for the swing arm. Um, you want to before you even get this far inspect those holes because if the threads are, are buggered and torn out, which they are in many cases, that this it would be a good time to fix that before you put it all together. You know, because of metal shavings, it's a whole lot easier to deal with. Um, you can put a time cert in, there's one way to do it. Something new that we have is actually um, two millimeter oversized bolts in stainless steel. So instead of uh, a 12, which is what that is, a 12 by 1.5, then we um, offer now a 14 by 1.5, still with a 17 millimeter wrench size, so you don't notice any difference. Um, from the outside, but it saves you from having to basically um, insert any sort of helicoil coil or a time cert or anything of that nature because you, all you're doing is just oversizing it up to a M14. Just from a, you, all you use a basically a decent tap set for that. So. Okay, I think that's about all the heat we need for this, hopefully so. And so you can take and put the bearing in the freezer, it's certainly not a bad idea. Okay, I'm just gonna check the tightness of my tool. Okay, so I got the bearing on, on this bearing driver here, so I'm just gonna sort of help it a little bit, get that all lined up. There we go. Okay, so that, that dropped most of the way in and I gave it a little tap to um, seat it and that's looking pretty good. Now we're moving right along. I'm just gonna get a little bit more heat on here. All right, so now this should just drop right into place too. Just like that. Just slipped right in beautifully. We take a socket just to be sure. Get that nice solid feeling and that's great. Okay now while this is nice and warm and boy is it. Glad I got these gloves on. Ooh, doggy that's hot. Man. And then moving quickly I'm going to just get this bearing in there as well while it's nice and warm. There it goes. It didn't just it was a little cock and then just went right in. It went in because of the expansion component. Okay, so that's great. Now all the bearings are in, and all we gotta do now is let this thing chill for a little bit and then we can get back onto it. Okay, so the next thing we do is put these parts back on. This thing's cooled off in the meantime a little bit. The washer could go in, and then this spacer with the chamfer facing up. Just like that. And then what we'll do is put this threaded ring back on with, with a new seal. So first we need to just install the seal. It goes in like that, drops in like so. And then you take a suitably sized socket that sort of fits nicely in like that. And then we'll give it a couple taps to seat it into place. Just make sure that you don't see a gap anywhere through here. And that looks really dandy. Okay, now that can be threaded in. And here we use our special tool that we use to take it back out again. And so that's sometimes a tight fit. So good idea is to make sure that that's seated in there nicely in every one of the grooves so you get a nice tight fit. Now, in the very unlikely event that there would be any oil leakage through past the threads, it's not a bad idea to put some sealant on those threads. Um, I'd stay away from anything like Loctite, um, some kind of thread sealant. What we're gonna be using here and also for the cover is this 
Likomali Flächendichtung, which is a, a gasket sealer, basically, that's to be used when you do in absence of a gasket. And it works good, it has good sealing properties, and it's not gonna bond the, the metals together, so upon disassembly in the future, it won't cause a problem, although you wanna heat this anyway when you take it apart. But nonetheless, I'm gonna just go ahead and put a little bit on the threads here. It's got this cool little bellows, so it's pretty easy to apply. We don't need much. Really, just a little bead like that, I think is really all that you need. I don't think you need to, to go too crazy. That'll, that'll seal it. I'm gonna go ahead and screw that in. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and torque that down while you're doing so. Hold good force on the tool. That's that. Always check your torque specs. That was like 80 foot pounds, 110 newton meters. Now this part can be installed. This gear. I'm just going to find that in there and slide that in. Pass a seal. All right, the next thing is this little gasket. When you took it apart, it, it, if you, when we took it apart, it looked like mush, and it really was. But anyway, um, that's what they look like when they're new. It's kind of this translucent rubber, and that fits right inside like that. Okay, the next thing I'm gonna do is now put my special tool back in place to hold that pinion gear. Engage the teeth here like that. So that'll hold that from turning when I go to tighten it. Put the washer in place. And then on the nut, I've already cleaned the threads off pretty well on both ends. I'm gonna just put a little bit of blue Loctite on here. Blue is efficient. You don't need anything super high strength. Nor do you really need very much of it. So that's fine. Now we'll screw that on. This one takes quite a lot of torque. So make sure that everything is secured well and then lean into it. Okay, so that's that. And we got everything spinning real nicely in there. So now we've got the pinion shaft, that, that's all buttoned, sealed, and ready to go. Now we can concentrate on the ring gear. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna be installing the bearing on the ring gear. It's gonna fit right here on there. And um, in preparation for doing so, I'm just heating the inner race up a little bit with a heat gun to expand a little bit. And it, it might hopefully just drop on at least most of the way and we can just drive it home on the press, but this is a good way to do it on such a large uh, diameter or bearing so that you don't get things cocked when you go to put it together. It should go on at least most of the way just from the expansion that occurs from heating the bearing. All right, let's see what happens. Go just like maybe a little tap with a brass punch just to kind of help it. Cool, that's a good start. All right, now I'm going to press it on the rest of the way. All right, the next thing we'll do now is put the tapered roller bearing. We already put the outer race in the case a while back. Remember, put the shim back in. We're going to use the same shim that came out of there. We're going to make the assumption, at least right now, that it's the correct size, which it probably will be, but we'll see. And um, there's, it's got a chamfered side that has to go down to correspond with it, a little bit of a rounded machine uh, process right there. And then this bearing goes on. Now, it actually is not the super tight, super tight fit, and you could heat it up. Wouldn't be a bad idea at all. Um, also, we can, I think, tap it on effectively. 
You just want to make sure you have a bearing driver that's not going to hit the out, outer race, that you'll damage it. It's, we're just talking about the inner part right there. You should be able to still move that. If you kind of get the idea. So that should just go on pretty easy. That's it. It's home. Okay. All right, now it's time to put these two pieces together. All right, so now this is where you really pretty much have to have this tool, in my opinion, or something to be pretty creative to make something like this. But here's the deal. The next thing we need to establish is, is there any backlash? In other words, how are these teeth, are they uh, engaging? If they're too far apart, you have like this sort of movement there. And if they're closer together, it's tighter. So you measure that in terms of backlash. Now, because it's on a tapered roller bearing, I could make that backlash be anything I want from zero to it, because it's just this, this piece is not being held captive. It's moved. You could put the cover back on, okay, as that would be one way to do it. But um, we can also use this tool. And this will fit perfectly onto the bearing. It's basically a, a perfect fit on there. Got to get the tool sort of um, bearing into the tool. There we go. So that plate sits on there perfectly and now tap this into position. And now we're in a much better position to determine what the backlash is because that that bearing is now being held completely perpendicular to the uh, axis of the bearing. So now this is the this is the setup that is is used for checking the backlash. Um, I don't even know where you'd begin to find something like this, but we luckily have one, so we can set you up if you need this work done. But you can at least see what's going on here. This is this tool expands inside of the ring gear and holds out this little paddle here, which is marked with this little red notch. The idea is to get that at really close to 90 degrees, which it is, and immobilize the pinion. And then move the ring gear back and forth. And you see the dial indicator, how it's going, bouncing back and forth there on that thing. So what I'm going to do Go ahead and zero that at one end. So we're getting right about three tenths of a millimeter of, of backlash. And that's too much. Maximum is about 0.2. So what we need to do is we need to change the shim on the tapered roller bearing. And we're gonna go with a little bit thinner shim because we're gonna drop it down so the teeth make more engagement and that should reduce the backlash. So, so what we can do is just simply remove these tools temporarily. By the way, this is how this thing works. It basically expands when you turn this knob, that expands, it fits right in there. It's made specifically for doing what we're doing. This pin here holds it all in place. Let me pull that all out. If we're careful, we can just leave the tool hooked up, which we'll do. Save a little bit of time there. And then I'm going to go ahead and pull this bearing back off again. Luckily, we know it's not a really tight fit, and we'll do that right now. All right, so I, using the Kugel Puller, I've taken the bearing back off again, and now we'll have a look at this shim and see how thick it is. It's 
We've got 2.55 is what that is. So I'm going to grab the next shim that is smaller, 2.5. We'll try that first. All right, so I've got, I've got a, a thinner shim here. I'm going to put that on and then put the bearing back on again. Okay, I've got everything set back up again here, and I'm gonna zero this out. And now let's see what we got. Okay, we're just at about 18. We're pretty much like right in spec. I mean, for a used set, I could go a little bit tighter, but the used set of gears like this, I think, we're it within specification and gosh. The attribute the increase in backlash to is just simply the material wear of the gears over the years. Even though they're really good shape, a little bit of wear always occurs. Some of the material has come off and it's disintegrated into the oil and gotten drained out, all, so, all that sort of thing. And in its place, there's been some, you know, gap established. And um, on a new set, I might try to go even a little bit tighter, but this is r right in spec. And for use set, I'm gonna run with it. I think it's gonna be great. So I go ahead and take all these tools back off again, and we'll keep moving along with the reassembly process. I removed the dial indicator and the centerpiece, we don't need that anymore, but we still need the plate for a few more operations here. But we're pretty happy with the um, backlash now, at least I am, and the next thing I want to do is just double check things in terms of the depth of the pinion gear. And for doing that, we're going to just pull this out with tool and all, and what I want to do is I want to see where are the teeth making contact along these arcs here. And for doing so, I'm going to put some of this dye, which is something called Prussian blue. And it's something that we use also for seating uh, valves, and every machinist knows about this. It's a pretty neat thing. It's just this blue dye. I'm going to put some on the teeth, on a few of the teeth here, on the pinion. Don't need to use much, just a bit here and there. And then I'll put this tool back in with the, the whole assembly here. Get that all set in real nice here again. Okay. Cool, now I'm just gonna simply sp spin the whole mechanism around a couple times in both directions. And then let's see what we got. Okay, what we can see here is where the pinion teeth are making contact with the ring gear. And you won't see it on every single tooth, but you can kind of see where it is. You see there's like a little spot right here. We're sort of middle to, towards the edge a little bit is where it's making contact on those teeth. And same on the back side here, kind of middle-ish. It's where we're making contact on there. So that looks pretty good. I kind of expected that to be the case because it's the original gear set actually that came out of this case and this case, and it's a matched set. So why would that really change? It makes sense that the backlash would change because the, the, the physical wear of the teeth would open that gap up, but the positioning isn't really changed by anything that has to do with wear. But it's always good to just double check that everything's cool, and we've done that. And so I'm just going to wipe some of this dye off of there. Not that it would really hurt anything, but what the heck. And then we'll move on to the next phase. Next thing we need to do is determine the, the thickness of shims that need to go between the cover and the top of the bearing. 
And what this is controlling is essentially the free or the, the, the play or lack of play, there should be in this one, of the whole ring gear assembly. Now on the older models, talking about slash five all the way up through 84, the, those run, those double, double shocks, let's call it, those run with a little bit of play, just a little bit of play. They also have a gasket um, on the cover. On the monolever bikes, and from 85 on, and also the R100GS, those, those have a tapered, that tapered roller bearing that we just messed with when we set the backlash. Um, th these have to be set with a little bit of preload. You, uh, tapered roller bearings, just like when we talked about steering head bearings, they always have to have a little bit, bit of preload to work. So what you can do is, here again, using this special tool, very important because it holds this bearing in place. Without it, it would cock in any direction. You'd get all kinds of wacky um, measurements. And what we're trying to do is we're going to measure from the, the uh, bearing outer race to the cover surface. And that's why there's a little cutout in our special tool here so we can actually get our gauge in there. And we take into consideration then um, the, the uh, distance from here to here. And then we'll also be measuring across the... Um, the cover, measuring from end to end here, down, and noting that, and then calculating the difference and the necessary preload, coming up with the right shim pack, and putting it all back together again. So that's a lot in one breath, but let's just do what we just talked about doing. If you watched our last video on the gearboxes, I used the same tool for that. It's got an extraordinarily long base, and it's a necessity really here to have a gauge like this that has a longer base on it because you want to be able to span the bearing comfortably and then still be able to get down to the gasket surface. So you can see how that's doing exactly that in my little cutout here. So I'm going to just drop that in and see what we got. Looks like uh, 15 point, uh, 15.95, awful close to 16. I'll try it uh, again in another spot just to be, just to be sure. You can rotate the plate around a little bit. Over to the next hole. Sure, we can see it real nice. Fifteen nine is what I say that is. Okay. <clears throat> now taking the cover. I'm gonna do some measuring on there as well. like 16.9, but always measure several times before you decide that, that it's right. I got 16.95. I'm thinking that's the most consistent measurement I'm coming up with. And 15.9 on the case. So 1.05 is the difference. Okay, so this is what I kind of come up with. I got 16.95 minus 15.9. 1.05 is the distance that we have in clearance. We want to have some preload in there. We, the specification is 0 0.5 to 0 0.1 millimeter of preload. And what we'll come up with is a shim we need would be probably ideal. Something right, right in there. So I'm going to go ahead and find out what the shims that came out of them, out of the final drive measure. And we'll see. I've got some shims here. I'm just going to measure those and some other ones that I have and come up with something that falls in that range. All right, I've come up with what I believe to be the correct shims. 
and it's, I think, going to be pretty spot on it's within spec. So now, in, get some of this stuff out of the way here. We're going to be reinstalling the cover, and in preparation for doing so, we need to put the new seal in the cover. So let's, thankfully, we have the special tool for installing the uh, new seal. It looks like this. If you didn't have one of these, well, you could probably still get it in, but it's certainly a nice thing to have. Use a very, very, very small amount of oil on here just to kind of help it, help it in. Not going nuts at all. Just a little film. Okay, so that's all nice and seated in there. And we won't need this tool anymore because we've done all our measuring. That can go. Now with the seal in, we can go ahead and put the rest of this together. And what I'm going to do is put the shims in, which I've already determined are correct. And I've put just a little bit of oil on the seal, just a little bit, so that it'll slip past this area here when we, when we uh, put these two parts together. And then, so to make it easier to assemble those, I'm gonna just give this a little bit of heat. All right, I think that's sufficiently heated up now. So that's pretty hot, I got my welding glove on, and now these two pieces can kind of go straight together like this. Like that, boom, because it's warm, goes together smoothly, and the shims don't fall out, pretty slick. Now we can just drop this whole thing right in there. But before we do, a couple things to think about. Got to remember to put this um, sheet metal piece back in. It just kind of drops in. However, if you're not careful, you can get a spot where it'll stick up onto the gasket surface, like for example here, and mess you up. So kind of make sure it's in there properly. The other thing is that there's no gasket and we need to put some sort of sealant in there. So what I like to use is once again, this flesh edition from uh, Lic Liquid Molly. It's a designed for the sort of thing, uh, two pieces of, of uh, well, in this case, aluminum mating together without any gasket. This forms a gasket that's also easy to remove if you need to. And it's a, got a great applicator. So I'm just gonna go in here and put in a small bead all around the circumference like that. Don't take much. There we go. Almost looks like a machine did that, huh? And then this part can go in. And we got to remember how it goes together with this, these holes lined up for the brake actuation rod. just fall into place like that. So we give it a couple taps. Okay, make sure that's all lined up nicely. And now we can go ahead and put the bolts in. Okay, at this point I've got all the bolts, run it down all the way, but just a little bit on the loose side. Oops, this one, one more here. Just a little bit on the loose side so that there's still, there's still a little bit of movement possible with this cover. I'm gonna try to center it really well, but the, here's the key. I gotta put this tube back in, and in just in case the two, this is really what dictates the alignment of the two covers from, from an axial standpoint. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in because this case is still a little bit warm. That went in real slick. And then I've got my special tool here, which we'll use to disassemble it. And we'll drive that in. Make sure it's protruding on both sides. Okay, good. So that 
actually aligns everything. Now we can go ahead and finish tightening those bolts. Awesome. There we have it. Pretty much we're, we've buttoned up this final drive and with the exception of the drain plugs and things like that, it's re this is another component ready to go back onto the motorcycle that we're working on the R80 uh, RT to S conversion. There's a lot more to come, a lot more stuff that that's, uh, we're going to be doing on this motorcycle, but now we're just, that's, we're one step closer. Make sure that you subscribe to our newsletter, to our YouTube channel, if you haven't already, so you can kind of know when new things are happening, like when I get my tooth fixed or something, who knows? And um, we're gonna keep, keep on trucking with, with this. So this is one of those videos that you can see, this is pretty complicated stuff. Not that it's really rocket science or anything, but it does require a lot of special tools. And we've got those tools here. We've got the parts in stock and you know, we can totally sort you out if you need repairs done to your component, whether it be your gearbox, your engine, final drive, or any other thing. No job's too small for us. We're all about BMW airheads and all BMW motorcycles, and we're here for you to help you in any way that we can. We're always adding new parts to our inventory, and um, we're working hard to make sure that we get the parts to you so you can work on your bikes. Now you have a lot of downtime, right? Because we are all practicing your social distancing like good people like we're all supposed to be doing right now and what a better thing to do than to be working on your motorcycle in your garage in your workshop or better yet out riding and you're being socially responsible and you're having a good time so that's what we're all about here to make that happen it's william from boxer two valve looking forward to the next episode see you then